Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Woo. Welcome, welcome. My name is Maria Franz. I am the director of the Business Government Society Initiative. It is an absolute thrill to be here today and to welcome you to our inaugural forum. I just want to thank you for spending time out of your busy lives to come and spend it at Stanford and help to contribute to what we think is going to be not only a great day, but a great initiative. We have an exciting morning planned, so let me kick us off by introducing our first speaker. Jonathan Levin is the Philip H. Knight Professor and Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's been Dean since 2016. He's widely regarded for his academic scholarship in the fields of microeconomics and industrial organization, having earned the John Bates Clark Medal for Outstanding Excellence by an American economist under the age of 40. He also served on President Biden's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Levin. Thank you, Maria. Uh, great, so thank you, Maria. And um, uh, today's a really wonderful day for uh, the business school and for Stanford, and thank you for uh, being a part of it. Uh, the Stanford Business School has an inspiring mission, which is to create ideas that illuminate management and to educate innovative principled leaders who will change the world. When I became the business school dean in September of 2016, there were many things that I knew would be important to advance that mission. Building the excellence of the faculty, elevating the school's position in management education, expanding our global footprint, forming new collaborations across the university. And what I did not expect at that time was just how profoundly the demands on business and on organizational leaders uh, would change. The speed of changes in technology, the political landscape, the expectation that business leaders would have to have a viewpoint and speak about societal issues, or at least would be expected to do that on a regular basis, as well as thinking about their own strategy and operations. And more broadly, increasing skepticism on both the left and the right in this country and in different parts of the world about capitalism and its ability to generate shared prosperity. And of course, education at the Stanford Business School is premised on the belief that organizations and markets and democratic institutions are a powerful force, perhaps the most powerful force to drive societal progress. And also on the belief that by preparing students as leaders, we can bring the ideas of our faculty to life and make a significant contribution to the world. Or as we say, to change the lives of our students and then have them go out and change organizations and change the world as our motto goes. And during the pandemic, we developed the idea for the Business Government Society Initiative with the, the idea that it would give us a chance to put the school at the forefront of emerging areas so debates about free markets and governance and regulation, advances in technology, sustainability and energy transition, and um, in that way respond to the changes in the world and get ahead of them. And our goal, of course, was to bring our research and teaching to bear on those issues. That's what we do best. That's the school's core. And then to integrate them into how we think about leadership education. Um, and, uh, and in the last two years, that Initiative, initiative already has generated new classes and new conferences, new workshops. It's supported more than 60 faculty research projects. It's led to the development of a leadership values survey that we now give to all of our incoming students and to our alumni starting this spring. It's fostered a strong partnership with the new Door School of Sustainability and other schools across campus. And one of the ambitions that we have had with the initiative was that we would be able to try to use the school, power of the school, to spark discussions among faculty and students and leaders from, from business and government and civil society. And this forum is very much in that spirit. And the idea for this forum actually came from a task force that I convened during the pandemic, led by uh, Professor Ken Schatz and Jim Coulter, one of our alumni, uh, and involved faculty and students and staff um, and uh, friends of the, of the school. Um, and I 
last week I went back and read the final report of that task force, which was articulating a vision for this uh, business government society initiative. And it was very interesting, actually, in light of subsequent events to go back and read that, that um, report, because it focused largely on two things. It focused on the school's role in promoting leadership responsibility, which is, of course, the title of this forum, and it focused on civil discourse. And um, this is written in the spring of 2021. And I'll just read you from the first two paragraphs, three paragraphs of this, of the, of the report that was written at the time. And it, which I just thought was so apropos of the world we're living in today. The report said, the Stanford GSB must prepare students for the responsibilities of leadership. To be clear, preparing students for leadership does not mean prescribing a particular set of values. It doesn't, it's not our role to tell students the right answers to difficult questions about policy or the social responsibility of business. That is something they must decide for themselves based on their own values. But we do have a responsibility to make sure they thoughtfully engage with these questions and have the knowledge to make informed decisions. And I think that's a perfect introduction to today's event. We're not here to receive answers but to learn something and engage in a discussion. And we're very fortunate to have some exceptional guests here today and speakers and to have an agenda that tackles a fascinating set of issues. So thank you all for being here and um, I hope you all have a great day. And now to get things started, I'm gonna introduce uh, our first speaker who's Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. Um, so uh, Jerome Powell, Chair of the Federal Reserve was appointed in 2018. Um, over the, he has had quite an interesting uh, six years at the helm of the Federal Reserve, as interesting as any uh, Fed chair in, in uh, recent memory, although there have been quite a few interesting episodes for Fed chairs in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, he has guided the Fed with a sure hand through a global pandemic, supply disruptions, an incredibly dramatic fiscal expansion, a lot of asset market volatility, first inflation of magnitude in many years, and somehow we've emerged with the U.S. economy continuing to create jobs and be the envy of the world. Um, and that range of experience, as well as Chairman Powell's responsible leadership, make him a perfect first speaker for our event. He is going to share some opening remarks, and then he's going to be joined on stage by Arvind Krishnamurthy. Arvind is the John Osterweiss Professor of Finance at the GSB, and he is himself an expert on asset markets, financial intermediation, and monetary policy. So with that, it's a pleasure to welcome Chairman Powell to the stage. Thank, thank you very much, Dean Levin. It's great to be here today. Thanks to everyone for coming out. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm gonna begin with some comments on the economy and the road ahead for monetary policy before briefly discussing the Federal Reserve's monetary policy independence, and then joining Arvind Krishnamurthy for uh, some discussion. So over the past year, inflation has come down significantly, but it's still running above the FOMC's 2% goal. In February, headline inflation was 2.5% over the past 12 months based on PCE index. Uh, a year ago, it was 5.2. Core inflation, which excludes the volatile food and energy components, stood at 2.8% in February, a year ago it was 4.8%. So this is very welcome progress, but as you can see, the job of sustainably re restoring 2% inflation is not yet done. Tight monetary policy continues to weigh on demand, particularly in interest-sensitive spending categories. Nonetheless, growth in economic activity and employment was strong in 2023, as real GDP expanded by more than 3%, and 3 million jobs were created, even as inflation fell substantially. This combination of outcomes <clears throat> reflects significant improvements in supply that offset to some extent the effects on demand of tighter financial conditions. The healing of global supply chains helped address pent up demand for goods, particularly in sectors that had faced considerable shortages, such as autos. In addition, labor supply increased significantly thanks to rising participation among 25 to 54 year olds, uh, workers in their prime working years, uh, as well as a strong pace of immigration. Recent readings on both job gains and inflation have come in higher than expected, 
the economy added in an, av an average of 265,000 jobs per month uh, in the three years through February, a faster pace than we have seen since last June. And the higher inflation data over January and February were above the low readings in the second half of last year. But these recent data do not, however, materially change the overall picture, which continues to be one of solid growth, a strong but rebalancing labor market, <clears throat> and inflation moving down toward 2% on a sometimes bumpy path. Labor market rebalancing is evident in, in many uh, parts of the data, including quits, job openings, surveys of employers and workers, and the continued gradual decline in wage growth. On inflation, it is too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump. We do not expect that it will be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2%. Given the strength of the economy and progress on inflation so far, we have time to let the incoming data guide our decisions on policy. We've held our policy rate at its current level since last July, as shown in the individual projections that the FOMC released just two weeks ago. My colleagues and I continue to believe that the policy rate is likely at its peak for this tightening cycle. If the economy evolves broadly as we expect, most FOMC participants see it as likely to be appropriate to begin lowering the policy rate at some point this year. Of course, that outlook is still quite uncertain and we face risks on both sides. Reducing rates too soon or too much could result in a reversal of the progress we've seen on inflation and ultimately require <clears throat> even tighter policy to get inflation back to 2%. But easing policy too late or too little could unduly weaken economic activity and employment. As progress on inflation continues and labor market tightness eases, these risks continue to move into better balance. As conditions evolve, monetary policy is well positioned to confront either of these risks. We are making decisions meeting by meeting and we'll do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. <clears throat> And that brings me to my second topic. The Fed has been assigned two goals for monetary policy, maximum employment and stable prices. Our success in delivering on these goals matters a great deal to all Americans. To support our pursuit of these goals, Congress granted the Fed a substantial degree of independence in our conduct of monetary policy. Fed policymakers serve long terms that are not synchronized with election cycles. Our decisions are not subject to reversal by other parts of the government other than through legislation. This independence both enables and requires us to make our policy decisions without consideration of short-term political matters. Such independence for a federal agency is and should be rare. In the case of the Fed, independence is essential to our ability to serve the public. The record shows that independent central banks deliver better economic outcomes. We recognize that we need to continually earn this grant of independence, and we do so by carrying out our work with technical competence and objectivity in a transparent and accountable manner, <clears throat> and by sticking to our knitting. By technical competence, I mean that the Fed policymakers use the most up-to-date information and research to deepen our understanding of the ever-evolving economy and to reliably deliver on our assigned goals. We're supported by a highly capable staff, we also draw on the insights and experiences of a wide array of business, academic, community, and labor leaders, as well as others engaged in the economy. And by objective, I mean that our analysis is free from any personal or political bias in service to the public. We will not always get it right. No one does. But our decisions will always reflect our painstaking assessment of what is best for our economy in the medium and longer term and nothing else. Transparency and accountability are fundamental for any government agency in a democracy, but are especially important for one granted policy independence. The Fed has a special obligation to explain ourselves clearly, to describe what we're doing and why we're doing it. We're always striving to improve this communication and it is a job that is never complete, uh, but we've come a long way. Uh, before 1994, the FOMC did not even announce monetary policy decisions. Today, we announced those decisions and we explained the thinking behind them in our post-meeting statement and press conference. We published detailed minutes of our deliberations and a quarterly summary of economic and policy projections of each FOMC participant. We publish a monetary policy report twice a year 
and the chair appears before Congress to present that report and to answer any and all questions that are on the minds of our oversight committee members. In 2020, we completed, completed a year-long public review of our monetary policy framework, and late, year, late this year, we will begin just such another review. My colleagues and I explain our views on the economic outlook and monetary policy in speeches like this one and in visits to communities around the country as part of an extensive, extensive outreach in which we seek input from individuals and groups throughout society. Transparency is an affirmative and proactive committed commitment to the public. Lastly, to maintain the public's trust, we also need to avoid mission creep. Our nation faces many challenges, some of which directly or indirectly involve the economy. Fed policymakers are often pressed to take a position on issues that are arguably relevant to the economy, but are not within our mandate, such as, for example, particular tax and spending policies, immigration policy, and trade policy. Climate change is another current example. Policies to address climate change are the business of elected officials and those agencies that they have charged with this responsibility. The Fed has received no such charge. We do, however, have a narrow role that relates to our responsibilities as a bank supervisor. The public will expect that the institutions that we regulate and supervise will understand and be able to manage the material risks that they face, which over time are likely to include climate-related financial risks. We will remain alert to the risk that there will be pressure to expand that role over time, but we are not, nor do we seek to be, climate policymakers. In short, doing our job well requires that we respect the limits of our mandate. Thank you, I'll stop there and, and look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Powell, for uh, those remarks and for taking some time to uh, be with us and talk to us today. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today. I think we have a lot of stuff to talk about, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, before I get started, I just want to also thank you uh, to the audience for sending uh, questions over. Um, what I've done is I've tried to organize the conversation around uh, two themes. One, uh, we'll start by talking about the macroeconomy, and then you have been shared through a very tumultuous period over the last five years, and I, I want to talk about the leadership challenges um, around that. So let me just dive right into it, pick up on something you, you started talking about, which is inflation. Um, two years ago, we had um, inflation readings close to 6 7%. We've come down to 3%. Last Friday, the PCE inflation index, the personal consumption expenditure inflation index, which is something the Fed often sp uh, speaks about, came in at 2.8%. Um, we had, we have, we've had a conversation about this. There's so many factors that have been play in the economy over the last uh, couple of years. I, I wonder if you can just uh, spend a some time talking to us about what you think are the key factors that have brought inflation down over the last uh, uh, last two years. Sure. So I think I'll start with where, where we think the inflation came from. So what is uh, actually different this time, at the risk of making that statement, uh, is that um, this inflation wasn't strictly just a question of demand overheating and the Fed coming in and having to suppress demand. That's been the more typical pattern, perhaps on the, on the back of, a, of, a, of a, a shock, such as an oil price shock and that kind of thing. This episode actually also involved, uh, as everyone will recall, the collapse of the supply side in a lot of ways. So supply chains stopped working. There were shortages of critical things like semiconductors, which turned out you couldn't make cars. I think many of us might not have realized how many semiconductors go into a car. Um, in addition, there was a, a major labor force shock. So we lost several million people out of the labor market. So there, we had a, you know, a, a very severe labor sh uh, shortage. So it was a supply side issue, as well as overheated demand from the closing and then reopening of the economy at a time when, uh, when rates were low and, and fiscal policy was very supportive of demand. So we had both of those things. And therefore, if those were the causes, what we, we needed to see was both the unwinding of the pandemic-related distortions to the, both the supply and demand in the economy, and also the effects of tight monetary policy. So today, what we think we're seeing as inflation has come down sharply over the last year is those two factors working together. And they, 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 work, they do work together. We think that uh, tight monetary policy weighing on demand actually gives the supply side a better chance to recover. And 2023, of course, was a year 
as I mentioned, a very significant supply side recovery and expansion. And uh, what are the, the <clears throat> factors that you're keeping an eye on, say, over the next uh, few years, maybe the next year or two that uh, might play out in the inflation picture? Um, I should also mention inflation expectations, which mm -hmm. in our framework and in the thinking of most monetary economists, uh, uh, people think that having the public expect inflation to return to 2% despite it moving up, that that's a very important factor in bringing inflation back down. In a sense, if people believe it, that price setters and wage setters in the economy, if they believe that inflation will be 2%, then, then that'll actually happen. So um, as we look ahead though, uh, you know, one question is how much more juice is there to come out of the supply side recovery. We also we got a very large increase in population last year, which may have helped with inflation. It mm -hmm. certainly helped with with output. Um, and it, it increased the potential output. You know, at the same time the economy is growing 3.1% last year, uh, or around that, uh, we also had inflation coming down sharply. So there may be more supply side gains to be had. Surveys of businesses still show uh, difficulties in hiring people, different difficulties in in getting the inputs that they need for their businesses. So there's some more benefit there. We also think that monetary policy is tight. It's weighing on uh, uh, interest sensitive spending in the economy. So for example, durable goods, surveys of, of consumers will say that it's, it's a tough time to buy durable goods because rates are high. Uh, you also see the labor market rebalancing because that you can look at demand in the labor market as well as supply, but you see De demand reflected in lower job openings, a very small increase in unemployment, in wages moving back down toward more sustainable levels. So we think those two forces that I that I mentioned will be the ones we'll be looking for. And the thing we'll be looking at, of course, is the incoming data on inflation as those affect the outlook. And the same thing about, about the labor market. What's happening in the labor market? Does it suggest that the labor market is continuing its, its progress and it's made substantial progress? to get back to uh, you know, a sustainable level of wage growth and, and balance between supply and demand. Uh, can I just dig into the inflation expectations point uh, you mentioned? Um, <clears throat> you know, the, an analogy that people drew a couple of years ago was to the high inflation episode of the 70s, where we had a high inflation period that then ended up shifting expectations and through the wage price mechanism ended up leading to a sustained period of high inflation. Um, in the current situation, I guess I have two questions. How concerned are you about maybe inflation getting stuck in the upper twos around three? Um, could that last mile be very hard because inflation expectations are getting stuck? And then relatedly, are there things you're looking at to tell you, um, to signal to you that that is an issue or isn't an issue? Right. So as I mentioned, um, Inflation expectations, we think, are an important part of, uh, of driving actually inflation. And we want them to be at levels that are consistent with 2% inflation over time, not 3%, but 2%, not 2.5%. The good news is that that's where they are right now and pretty much have been uh, for some time. And we look, we look at you know, surveys of businesses, households, forecasters. We look at... Um, other kinds of measures of uh, inflation expectations and you know, model-based and things like that. We also look at um, market-based. You know, the market is always um, buying and selling inflation protection and you can get from that expectation of, uh, or you know, assessment of what markets expect. And all of those are pretty consistently saying that the public does believe, and it's a good thing because it's true, that inflation will go back down to 2%. So that's very, Assuring, but that's partly because of the very strong action that we took and also because of our ongoing commitment to actually return inflation to 2% over time. So, and, I, and that, that is our commitment, by the way, we're, but, but over time, you know, we're, we're uh, so I, I would say it would be a concern if inflation mm -hmm. expectations were not to be consistent with, with the outcome that we seek. But the good news is they're not. And, you know, I think our commitment is, is understood and respected and believed uh, by the public, and, and that's as it should be. Let me flip to the other side of the equation. Um, we've had employment, economic activity that remained quite strong. Uh, the unemployment rate is really, it's remained below 4% for the last uh, two years. And this is during a period in which you've took the funds rate uh, from 0% to 5.3% in about as fast a rate hike cycle as uh, we've seen in history. Um, 
a year ago, many people were talking about the possibility of recession. Um, that hasn't happened. Um, again, you, you made some remarks about this, but I wonder if you can just go a little bit more into this. Why hasn't this happened? Why have uh, we achieved what looks like a soft landing, which is inflation coming down, um, unemployment remaining low? What's, what are the factors that have played out? And, and then the related question, do we think this will continue to happen? over the next year or two. Yeah, so I guess it's, I've always had the view and always said that mm -hmm. uh, because of the unusual origins of this inflation and its differences from other prior episodes, there was a path to getting inflation back down, re restoring price stability, getting inflation back down sustainably to 2% without the kind of large job losses and increases in unemployment that had been typical of prior tightening cycles. And the reason again was that some part of this was so was independent of demand. Uh, when, when, if you have to get all of the inflation reduction gains from suppressing demand, then ch the chances are that you that that will involve uh, that will weigh on unemployment and, and economic activity pretty significantly. But here we had we had you know the the, the situation for ticks against semiconductors. You couldn't buy a car at the very time when people wanted cars because they were moving to the suburbs because they didn't want to ride on public transportation because of COVID. At that precise time, the supply of cars went down dramatically because of the shortage. So what happens is the prices went way up. That's how the market clears in our in our economy. So on the other side of that, though, without any, without respect to demand, once this this the semiconductor supply comes back, you should come right back down that curve. And you could, in principle, uh, get inflation down significantly without just ignoring demand for a second. Mm -hmm. So I always thought that was possible. And I would say something like that is, 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 appears to be happening. Um, sorry, so then your question is, um, how did that happen? So more recently, 2000, we expected that to happen at the very beginning. And that's why we thought the inflation was transitory, meaning it would go away quickly without much effort from us. That turned out not to be the case. And we thought then in 2000, that was in 2021. In 2022, we thought the supply side would recover more. It really didn't. And we won't begin, I certainly began to wonder whether that was going to happen. And then it really happened in 2023. Right about the time we were almost ready to give up on supply side recovery, you got this significant increase in labor force participation accompanied by uh, a, a significant move up in, in, uh, in immigration. And you also got the unwinding of the supply side problem. So what's happening is when, when that happens, potential output is going up significantly. The economy is pr productive capacity. So you have a situation where productive capacity is going up even more than actual output. And so the economy actually isn't becoming tighter, which it ordinarily would. It's actually becoming a little looser and you're seeing inflation come down. Very unusual situation. The pandemic has been you know, a textbook of, of unusual, unexpected developments and situations. But that really is the story. And then, then Arvin, the question is, how much more are we going to get out of the supply side recovery and how much will fall to demand? And we just don't know the answer to that. You know, we're not going to prematurely assume that, that, that there's no more progress to be made on the supply side. Indeed, the evidence is that, that there probably is more, more gain to be had there. You had mentioned immigration has been a big part of... Uh... The last year or two in terms of the supply side um can you just expand on that is that um how how important is that relative to supply chain um where do you see that playing out over the next year or two so i need to i need to start by saying that the fed is not an immigration policy maker and don't comment on those who do have that assignment and or the policies that they make it's really just we're just calling the balls and strikes on the economy as we see them and so from that standpoint you know, we've been our economy's been short labor, and and probably still is. If if you um, if you talk to and we we do talk to a lot of business people, it's still difficult to to hire for many many companies. So we've needed more people. So what but what happened uh, over the course of last year is to a much greater extent than had been thought. Um, immigration moved up quite a bit over the last two years, and this is. Uh, uh, typically, the, the Census Bureau does all this estimating. The Congressional Budget Office actually went and took a different path and talked to uh, border the people who work at the border and that kind of thing, and got a much higher estimate, which now many groups have gone out to validate. And it's, I would say it's clear there's something there. The numbers are actually higher, and that actually explains what you know what we've been asking ourselves, which is how how can the economy have grown over three percent in a year where almost 
every outside economist was forecasting a recession. An overwhelming majority anyway were forecasting a recession for 2023. Not only did that not happen, we had better than 3% growth. So really a remarkable performance. And some part of that is that, that there are significantly more people working in the country. And they've, but then how does inflation come down? It's because you know, potential, so the capacity of the economy has actually moved up perhaps more than the actual output. So it's, it's a bigger economy, but not a tighter one. Really an, an unexpected mm -hmm. and unusual thing. Again, we don't make judgment calls, but that's what we're seeing. <clears throat> so it's interesting in this discussion we've had about inflation and um, unemployment, we have talked about uh, real factors, um, immigration, supply chain, healing. That's the stuff that seems to have played out. We haven't really talked about interest rates uh, per se, which is, of course, the primary tool uh, of the Federal Reserve. Um, I want, it looks from the outside like the interest rate sensitivity of the economy in this cycle has been very muted, very different than in the past. There's also, you look at the economy, they look like there's very differential impacts across different parts of the economy. The housing market, people have long-term fixed rate mortgages, so interest rate pass through there is very low. Um, here in Silicon Valley, we have you know, early stage growth businesses where the cost of capital is uh, affected by the higher rates. And there we, you, we ha it looks like we have a much bigger impact. How, so I, I wonder if you can speak about the interest rate sensitivity of the economy in this cycle. And then an another question, a related question, which is we have differential impact ac across the economy. How do you think about balancing the impact of interest rate hikes in different sectors? So um, th I guess the headline for me would be that I do think monetary policy is working and working broadly as expected. I think you can point to uh, sectors of the economy, and you, you mentioned a couple. So if you're a household that has a low interest mortgage, you're not feeling the, the, the effect of higher mortgage rates. And many companies as well uh, took the opportunity to term out their debt uh, you know, before rates went up. So you have, you have a lot of companies that have longer term fixed rate debt at pretty low rates, and they're not as affected by it. That's, that's all true. At the same time, um, it, again, if you look at uh, interest-sensitive spending, either in housing or durable goods, you're seeing very significant effects there. Um, and I do think you see the economy rebalancing. So I, I don't. I think it's not right, and maybe too soon to conclude that there's some significant disconnect there in terms of monetary policy transmission. I would. So, but it still leaves the question of of how the economy can have grown over three percent during a year in which monetary, the, the, the federal funds rate is at a quarter century high. Why wouldn't growth have been lower? And to me, the answer to that is the supply side recovery. I think that's what people need to understand is that you have this force from outside. It's not just interest rates and demand. You've got a supply side recovery that is creating new demand and new supply. And that's why you get a number like 3.1% at the same time inflation is coming down. Uh, one of the reasons why. So it, I think that that's really the story. It's not that uh, that the, that, that the um, policy isn't restrictive, and it's it's not that the economy is not responsive to rates. It's we've it's that we've had this outside force that is temporarily affecting that. Um, so if I benchmark um, Fed policy right now, you know we have rates at five point three percent. Inflation is running a little bit under three. That's like a two and a half percent real interest rate. That's really the real cost of borrowing. Compared this to pre-pandemic, we had real rates of close to zero, maybe half a percent, um, sometimes negative. That's, so we've, we've gone from a, a very low rate environment to a very high rate environment. Policy looks tight right now. Um, you know, another benchmark, uh, I don't know if my colleague John Taylor is here, but the Taylor rule is a, a typical benchmark we use for thinking about a central bank policy. And by the Taylor rule, uh, policy rates right now should be around four. So it policy does look quite restrictive right now. Um, and I think in, in talking about where policy is right now, you've said that the uh, risks are balanced. Um, why, why continue to have tight policy in an environment in which uh, the risks are balanced? Um, so we do think that policy is restrictive. We think it's doing its job. Um, we, we, I would go back to what I said in my remarks to start, which is the, we think the risks are two-sided. So there's a risk of, if, if you cut too soon, the risk is that, that the progress on inflation will stop. 
or that even it will reverse. And we've seen that some in some historical, uh, particularly in, in the 70s. We don't think that's what's happening here at all, but, but that's a risk that we have to manage. The other risk is that we wait too long or move too slowly once we do move. And in that case, you have, you know, you have weakening in the labor market and, in, and economic output. So we, we, you know, we, we're trying to steer between those two risks. Obviously, we're trying to be in the middle and get, it, get the timing right. It's very challenging. There is no risk-free path, but we're we, and I think we're in a position to address the economy moving in, in either of those directions. The, the, so the, the risk, though, of, of moving too soon really is that the economy, uh, you know, really does, uh, the deflation does move up. And then that, that's, it really be, would be quite disruptive if we were to have to then come back in. We will do what, what we have to do to get inflation down to 2%. But again, it's, it's about balancing those risks. It's, it's, it's never the case that you can confidently look at the baseline and say, this is what we're going to do. It's always about having a baseline understanding but then knowing what the risks are and, and, and having the committee be in a position to be able to address those should they materialize. And I think, I think we're very much in that position now. Um, maybe I can, I can just follow up on that. Mm -hmm. So is, I, I, I'm gonna ask a question, what is there a signal or a data point that you're paying particular attention to over the next year? And I'm gonna ask it this way. So if you had a crystal ball <laughs> that <laughs> you knew could perfectly answer one question about the next 12 months, what question would you ask? What, what's, what's the thing you really want to know? <laughs> Sorry, there isn't any, there's no one thing. It, yeah. it, it really is. We have a dual mandate. You're asking me to be single-minded about the dual mandate. No, just, just a kind of a data point that you think is, <laughs> is, is will guide you. <laughs> Can't do that. Um, no, I mean, we, we have to, the, the, I, I would say this. Uh, mm -hmm. In our framework, the, the, the two goals, max, price stability and maximum employment are equal under the law. But our framework literally says that that if you're very far from achieving one of the goals and the other one is pretty much at goal or even better than goal then you focus on the one that's far from goal this is obvious right so and that's what we did after inflation came up in march of 21 and then we we really had a very tight focus and you heard us talk you heard us talking about you know getting inflation under control but as they as inflation has come down the two things are moving back into balance and you know we're we're not a single mandate bank the, the, the key thing I'll end with, though, is <clears throat> price stability is uh, it gives us the ability to, to achieve both goals. We, if we don't have price stability, then we're not going to have these long periods of tight labor markets, which benefit everyone. What we saw in the 10 year, eight month expansion <clears throat> that ended with the pandemic was for the last two or three years, the people at the lower end of the income spectrum were getting the largest wage increases. <clears throat> and you saw the gaps between black and white unemployment go to historic lows. So a tight labor market over a long period of time does enormous social good. And that's what we all want to do is we want to get back to that. For that, you need price stability. But they were, so the two of them actually are, are quite complementary. Um, I'm going to shift from just talking about the near, ter near <clears throat> term to the thinking about a, the longer term for the US economy. Um, We've had a pretty big shift in growth expectations for long run growth. This comes out from the Fed's own projections as well as from economic forecasters projections from 15 years ago. Long term growth forecasts were 2.8 percent, 3 percent pre pandemic. They've been below two. That's kind of where they've been for long term growth forecasts. That's where your own forecasts have been. Um, how? Why do you think that is? Why? Why long term growth at 2 percent? Uh, we're sitting in Silicon Valley. AI is all the buzz here. We've had high growth over the last few years. Could is is two a reasonable number? Is it possible we could go back to the two point eight three percent that we had uh, in the early two thousands? Well, let me let me start <clears throat> by saying that sort of every bit of the economy is difficult to forecast. There's there isn't one that's more difficult to forecast than productivity, for example, which is one of the key elements of longer term growth. So very 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 uncertain. I mean. It, Basically, what longer term growth is is a function of growth in hours worked and of, and, of, and, and of output per hour. And hours worked is really a function of demographics and, and more than anything else. And productivity output per hour is highly unpredictable. So we I think people lowered their longer run uh, growth expectations to around, I guess, one point eight percent is the median, something below two percent. That's given our very what had been our very low population growth, 
and expectations of productivity might be one and a half percent, one percent, one and a half percent kind of thing. Productivity growth I mean, in, in output per hour. That's a pretty good place to be. Um, we've had higher productivity than that recently. And the question is, is it going to be a sustained thing? Are we going to enter into a new period of higher productivity? That would be great. It, it is productivity growth that lifts, you know, all boats uh, generation upon generation. And, you know, so people argue AI can, can be that effect. You, some people are arguing that, all, you know, there were a lot of business starts at the beginning of the um, pandemic and during the pandemic as Americans went out and started businesses at that time. Um, and also that you've seen a, a real, uh, you've seen a lot of change in the labor force. So people moving, quitting, going to better jobs that might be better suited to their skills. But all, all of those things, they, they can, they could become a, a longer run productivity increase or not. They, those might just be the things that we need to get one and a half percent productivity. And they might, they might, it's just, it is, it is unknowable. And uh, particularly with AI, the, you know, the range of potential outcomes, it's, it's, it, it should increase productivity. Everyone sees that. But that's not what we're seeing in the numbers now. It, it's too soon for AI to be affecting, I think, uh, the productivity numbers. But, you know, the logic of it is that it could actually, uh, you know, increase productivity. And then the question will be, what does it do to labor? Uh, is it going to replace labor or augment labor or both? And in what, if so, in what proportion? So hard to say about longer run growth. But, you know, of course, it would be great if that were the case. And then just to follow up, we talked about this before. Do you do you feel like you need to take a stand on this in in policy making at current? In no, I mean, so our our focus, the, the things that are really important to the U.S. economy over time are productivity, immigration, even trade policy, industrial the things that we're doing, industrial policy that 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 is now a thing. Those are those are important to the longer run growth and economic well being of Americans. And what we do, we can. What we do is we try to move the economy towards stable prices and maximum employment through the business cycle. That's what we can do with business rate, with with, um, uh, with monetary policy. We are also a crisis responder. We're a really important crisis response responder. We can get there quickly. We have great tools for it. So that's a key thing that we do. We also regulate and supervise the banks, and it's important. And we look after financial stability. So all those are very important things but they're not things that affect the longer run potential output of the United States. So uh, honestly though, so the, the question of what will be the, the uh, you know, equilibrium interest rate, the, the neutral interest rate going forward, doesn't really matter for policy today. We we're really asking about once the pandemic is well and truly behind us and we're well into the AI uh, investment boom and the effects of AI, what will that look like? And it doesn't really matter that much for getting inflation down to 2% while keeping the economy growing and the labor market strong. Yeah. Can I shift uh, tax and talk about some of the challenges of leading the Fed through the last five years? So, um, you know, just in our discussion, and it's clear from looking at the world, we've, you've had so many different shocks. Um, economies behaved in so much unusual ways over the last uh, few years. Uh, you were appointed Fed chair in 2018. I remember pre-pandemic, the dominant concern of the Fed was low inflation not high inflation, it was hitting in, having inflation below target, below the 2% target. COVID happened, we've gone in a completely different direction. So can you just speak about the challenges of taking an organization that was focused on one thing to focusing on something completely different? Yes, it's, well, it's certainly been a turbulent time, I will say, to, to uh, Dean Levin's points. It's been um, uh, really a, a lot of things and things that weren't expected. You know, for, for 20 plus years around the world, uh, econ economies suffered from, you know, lower interest rates, lower inflation, slow growth, low productivity, bad demographics. And a, a lot of uh, monetary economists were working on how do, how do you make your tools work at a time when you're, you're going to be bounded by zero and you won't be able to cut and make and, you know, and support the economy. So this was a big and that was a big thing. And then so that then the inflation that came, it really, really arrived in the first quarter of 2021 was, was a surprise to most people. And again, the macro econ economists generally thought that it would go away over time. Not everyone. There, there were some concerns expressed and ultimately it is coming down significantly. So that was, uh, you know, we had to we had to pivot on that and we did when when it became clear really in the fall of 2021 it became clear through the labor market data the inflation data the growth data 
that the economy was not moving back toward price stability. And we pivoted, and when we pivoted, we really moved. So because, you know, I, I, it was the right thing to do. Um, so the good news about monetary policy is it can move quickly. The emergency tools we have, as I mentioned, are, are agile compared to other government policies, and they have a significant effect on the economy. So I think we've gotten to what is, knock on wood, a pretty good place. We're using our tools now to try to, you know, try to bring inflation down the rest of the way to 2% while, while keeping the economy strong and the labor market strong as well. I mean, the other side of this tumultuous <clears throat> period that we've been through is the external pressure uh, from the Fed, um, from outside over where to set interest rates. Um, and you have faced this pressure over the last six years, uh, including from uh, the former president. So how do you navigate <laughs> the, the decision-making of the Fed in the larger scheme of pr pressures coming in from the outside? So the thing is, um, internally, we have peace of mind on this because everybody who works at the Fed knows that we're going to do what we're going to do, and we're going to do it for economic reasons. And that's that's it, as I mentioned in my remarks. And I mean, I think you can go back and look, you can, anybody can read the verbatim transcripts of um, uh, of the things that we discuss during. It doesn't doesn't matter what what the election calendar is saying. Whatever whatever's happening in the economy, those are the decisions we make. Decisions based on the analysis that I described in my remarks. So I think we know that. So it becomes, but it's a communication issue that people need to understand that that's what we do. It's always what we do. If you look at the modern historical record, you'll see that the Fed has been prepared to move or not move and do what it thinks is, is the right thing for the economy in the medium and longer term without regard to kind of outside considerations. And it's important to just have people know that, which is why I brought it up. I'm not, I don't have concerns that you know that that it's going to be a problem for us we're go because we're going to do what the right thing is for the economy over time and my colleagues and i are tightly focused on that um maybe you can just say a little bit more about that i mean you're uh you're praised by many people in your uh your ability to build consensus you served in different white house administrations uh with different uh political ideologies uh, how how do you do that in practice uh do you have any advice for all of us and so for, it, it, it boils down to two things one is you know we have a specific mandate stick to that mandate focus on that mandate and don't be dragged into partisan political fights around i mean when i testify people are always trying to get me and my, and my colleagues to to support their perspective on you know fiscal issues or, or immigration issues and they try they, they think of an economic hook and they try to <laughs> but we just don't do that we stay with that's part of it the other part of it just is um uh I, I spend a lot of time with in our system of government oversight comes through congress in a parliamentary system it's it's through the elected government but because those those that's also that's the same people who are in the in the parliament but for us, it's not the administration that has legal oversight responsibility. It's it's the Congress, the House and the Senate, and particularly the two uh, oversight committees, one in the House, one in the Senate. And so, my colleagues and I spend a lot of time, and we, you know, we we don't go up there to blast talking points at people. We want to hear what they're thinking, and and we want to listen carefully and respectfully, and and tell them what we're thinking. And I think people appreciate that. That's the thing. Same thing internally. You know, I think when when you listen respectfully and understand what what people are saying and try to you know think about how how to incorporate that thinking into what you're doing for most people most of the time that's going to be enough uh and so they can go along with things that they don't 100 percent support but they feel like they were heard or they're or they're not going to uh you know maybe criticize quite as as harshly as they would because they realize that you're doing this in good faith to the absolute best of your ability and with and based on the actual facts and what we know about the ever evolving economy and can i can i just ask um, about how your own background has helped in this process so you are a person who has shifted between the public and the private sector over the course of your career um and you you're a lawyer by training you don't have an economics phd you're running an organization which is mostly a, a phd or many phd economists so can you just speak about um, how your background has helped you navigate this? Sure. So I, when I graduated from college, I had no plan other than this idea that I liked 
what I saw of the careers of people like George Schultz or Cyrus Vance, for example. Uh, and that the idea was these are people who had a, had a mainly private sector career, but served in the government at intervals and were able to do public service. I, I grew up in Washington, D.C. My family was not involved in any of this, really. But, um, but this is what I observed, and I thought, that's, that would, I would like to do that. And by some miracle, that's kind of what happened. It wasn't careful planning. Um, so I, wanted, I always wanted to do public service, and I, I wound up doing that. I, was, I served as an aide on the Hill. I was walk, all, all these different things that I've done. So that's how, that's how that happened. And then I'll ask one last question for this. Do you have any advice for the students in this room whose interests are to move between public and private sector? So I think, it's a, I think that's a great plan for people. Uh, people have different tolerance levels for volatility. So, I mean, I quit the law and went into investment banking, quit investment banking, went into private equity, quit private equity and went into public service. You know? So if you're willing to tolerate volatility and steep learning curves, I mean, then if you're that person, then that's a great way to go. The other thing I'll say though, is I have really found that <clears throat> when I was a, a partner at a private equity firm, I asked the, <clears throat> the head of the investment, area. What do you look for? I mean, it's all about picking good CEOs and good business models. What do you look for in a good CEO? And the answer was, you know, there's no one model. And that's really important. There, are, I've seen very different people be successful in leadership roles. Very, very different people. And you, it, it's, it's in, I, I don't know if it's in every person, but it's in a lot of people to find your own way to lead. And, and it, it, you don't have to be one way or another. You know, I can think of one um, person at the Fed who was, she had a way of, of being a very soft talker. And by the end of the meeting, everyone was leaving, leaving there thinking, how do I do her? How do I do what she said? You know, it's like, I want to do that. It's just, it's, it's in everybody and you should have the self-confidence. What I experienced when I first had to lead things was complete lack of self-confidence. Oh my God, I'm not ready to do this. And that's, I think that's very common for people. <clears throat> I think people get more coaching now, but I would just say, be confident in your own abilities to lead and take things on and take risk because that, that, that will, uh, that's, if I could say that to my, something to my younger self, I think that would be it. Um, Jay, we're, we're running on time here um, and there's lots more stuff we could talk about, but I'm mindful of time. So let me just, first of all, thank you uh, on behalf of Stanford for uh, being here. Uh, engaging us in this conversation. It's been very stimulating. Uh, I know I learned a lot and I hope we all learned a lot. And again, so thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Thank you.